Roger Sperry, a noted neuropsychologist and neurobiologist, was born August 20, 1913 in Hartford, Connecticut. He attended Oberlin College where he majored in English. He took an introductory psychology class from a professor that worked closely with William James. This class sparked an interest in, his, in the brain and he decided to pr pursue a master's degree in psychology in 1937. He further pursued his education at the University of Chicago where he obtained his PhD in zoology. During this time, he conducted some of his famous experiments with the intent to answer the age-old question, nature or nurture. These experiments included, included switching the left and right motor neurons in rats and rotating the eye of frogs 180 degrees. These experiments indicated that there was no adaptive functioning of the nervous system and that there are intricate chemical codes that were under genetic control. For his postdoctoral research, he worked with Carl Lashie at the Yerkes Primate Research Center in Florida. His research was focused on the rearrangement of motor and sensory nerves. He then taught at the University of Chicago until being diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1949. He moved to New York for treatment where he published his first paper on the mind and brain in the American Scientist. In 1952, he began working at the NIH as Section Chief of the Neurological Diseases and Blindness. Two years later, he began working at the California Institute of Technology as a professor of psychobiology. His most famous experiment on split brain patients was influenced by research on learning in cats. Sperry taught cats to solve a problem using one eye, but when the other eye was used, the cats could still solve the problem. When Sperry later cut the nerves in a way that the left eye was only connected to the left hemisphere and the right eye was only connected to the right hemisphere, the cat could, could not solve the problem learned by the opposite eye. It was initially thought that the severing of the corpus callosum had no effect on behavior, and the corpus callosum's only function was for support uh, both hemispheres. Research and tests conducted by the split brain patients by Sperry and Michael Gazzaniga determined that the severing of the corpus callosum does in fact affect functioning. The test included presenting a word to one eye. If one word was shown to the right eye, then it was processed by the left hemisphere, and then the patient would report seeing the word. If the word was shown to the left eye, then it was processed by the right hemisphere, and the patient would not be able to report seeing the word. Sperry concluded from these observations that the main language center was housed in the left hemisphere, although the right hemisphere does have some rudimentary language skills. In another experiment, a word was shown to a patient's left eye and a tray of objects was placed before the patient. The word was shown among the objects on the tray. The participant was asked to asked about the word and they were unable to describe what the word was but could pick up the correct object without being able to provide an explanation. The right hemisphere of the brain was able to recognize the word and direct the motion to pick up the corresponding object. This occurred because the right hemisphere was unable to communicate what the left eye saw to the language center of the left hemisphere. In a final experiment, two different objects were shown, to, one to each eye. The participant was asked to draw what they saw and the participant drew the object that was presented in the left eye. When asked to explain what they had drawn, the participant would describe the picture presented to the right eye. Here's an example of these studies conducted by Michael Gazzaniga on his participant, Joe. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his dis disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Okay. Right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. Grapes. Good. When Joe focuses on a point, Look right at the dot. Everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, Joe is easily able to name it. See it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Pan. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. But Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. 
What did you drop? Car. What'd you see? Wheel on one side. I don't know where I saw the other. So even though he can't name it, his left hand is able to draw out a picture right. of the stimulus of the picture or word that right. we presented to his right half brain. At the time that Sperry was conducting this research, there was little to no coverage in the media for the general public. However, now there have been references to Sperry and Gazzaniga's research in sources like the New York Times newspaper, and though perhaps not identifiable by name, he and his research are fairly well known, especially in the scientific community. His research was met with very little controversy, as all of his participants had already undergone the split brain surgery. Due to severe epilepsy, their corpus callosums were severed in order to reduce and prevent their seizures. In fact, the only consistent problem people seem to have with his findings is that they have a hard time letting go of the idea that humans are inherently, quote-unquote, left or right-brained. Among other awards, Roger Sperry received the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 1981 for his research on split-brain patients. He also received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 1991 from the American Psychological Association. Because Sperry was the first to delve into this kind of research, he opened the door for the study of brain lateralization. He also changed the way we think about the brain as a whole. The idea of each hemisphere working independently of each other, almost creating two consciousnesses, used to be unthinkable, especially to those like Descartes and his followers, who believe the mind to be wholly indivisible. This idea of two separate consciousnesses, not to be confused with dissociative identity disorder, has been evidenced by studies done by neurologist B.S. Ramachandran, which he will explain in this brief clip. It can't talk. The right hemisphere cannot talk. But it can comprehend simple semantics, simple questions. Left hemisphere, of course, can talk. So you can present boxes, yes, no, I don't know. So we asked, for example, are you at Caltech? And the right hemisphere pointed to yes. Are you on the moon? It said no. Are you... Uh, uh, are you um, in California? I said, yes. Are you asleep? I said, no. Then I said, are you a woman? And the patient was male. And he pointed to yes, and then started chuckling and laughing. So at least the right hemisphere has a sense of humor. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now comes the big question. What if you ask, do you believe in God? So I said, do you believe in God? And the right hemisphere went straight to yes. Right? Ask the same question to the left hemisphere, yes, no, I don't know, it went to no. Sperry theorized that when the brain's two halves are connected by the corpus callosum, the individual mechanisms are influenced and overshadowed by the higher level overarching system of the mind. In other words, there is within the brain system a sort of top-down functioning in which mental state affects how the brain is working at that moment. These ideas were met with mixed feelings, and in the beginning, Sperry was faced with much criticism from his peers. But as time passed and he continued to talk and write about his theories, the scientific community began to accept and even welcome the idea that the brain is more than just microfunctions and that those microfunctions are influenced by higher cognition. Much like John Dewey and formal functionalism as a whole, Sperry believed in the idea that humans should be seen and studied not only on the micro level, but on the macro level as well. After an illustrious career, Roger Sperry died at the age of 80 in April 1994 though his research still remains relevant to this day.